Have you ever flown a kite? It looks easy, but that depends on the weather. It's beautiful to see how the wind can cause it to ascend up into the air and how it could fly away if we don't hold on tight enough. In the 1964 Disney dual live action and animated films, Mary Poppins, the Banks children, Jane and Michael, are searching for their lost kite. It is in their search that, for that kite that life in the Banks household begins to unravel. Their nanny, Katie Nana, quits, since this is not the first time that Jane and Michael have run away. And Mr. Banks, or George, is unamused when his children are escorted home by the constable. Impatient and ignoring their request to help them find the kite, Mr. Banks begins to find a more stern and no-nonsense nanny for his children instead. For those who are unfamiliar with the film or have not read the book series by P.L. Travers, in which the film is based on, it is at this point that we see the vulnerability of these young children who decide to make their own list of qualifications for their ideal nanny. The children's advertisement for their perfect nanny reads, if you want this choice position, have a cheery disposition, rosy cheeks, no warts, play games of all sorts. You must be kind, you must be witty, very sweet and fairly pretty. Take us on outings, give us treats, sing songs, bring sweets. Never be cross or cruel, never feed us castor oil or gruel. Love us as a son and daughter and never smell of barley water. If you won't scold and dominate us, we will never give you cause to hate us. We won't hide your spectacles so you can't see, put toads in your bed or pepper in your tea. Hurry, Nanny, many thanks. Sincerely, Jane and Michael Banks. One might think that maybe these are not characteristics they are looking for in a nanny, but in their own parents. What they are seeking, really, from George. Maybe it's not an advertisement at all, but a prayer. Again, George Banks is not concerned with his children's yearning for a kind and sympathetic nanny. So he tears up that advertisement and throws it in the chimney. And the beauty of miracles, or in the case of this film, magic, the nanny's advertisement reappears in the hands of the magical Mary Poppins, who is practically perfect in every way. It is in her perfection of meeting all the specifications that the children had hoped for in a caregiver, someone who was fun and kind, who loved them as a parent, balanced patience and respect. She may appear like a miracle worker as she miraculously cleans their room by snapping her fingers and pulls a coat stand and a floor lamp out of her small bag made of carpet. But she is no miracle worker, and she is not perfect, even practically. It may appear that she takes them on perfect outings filled with excitement and magic, like a carnival carousel ride inside a chalk drawing with animated characters, or having them fly as they laugh and get higher and higher to the ceiling. But her perfect outings are not perfect at all, as rain washes the chalk drawings and leaves them soaking wet, and Michael's refusal to invest his tuppence, or coin, in the bank that his father works at, ends up with George being fired. Yet in all her abnormal outings, Mary Poppins, her practical perfection, is not about her truly being perfect, but in teaching them to care for others that are not. For Mary Poppins, it is not about the children being perfect or her family, or the family living into a perfect image. It's about providing them opportunities to know who, one another, especially each other's imperfections, to be transformed by that knowledge, to be transformed by the love that they have for one another. And in doing this, she allows them to save themselves and save their family from a life of detachment and distance among one another. She gives them the opportunity to save themselves from missing out on being transformed by their love for one another that makes them want to fly kites and be known. And in their loving relationship with one another, 
They know, they, with one another, they show those around them that knowing one another's needs and paying attention, that is what unifies them, not attempting to gain perfection. Many interpretations of P.L. Travers and Walt Disney's Mary Poppins is that she is the savior in the story, the one who saves George from missing out on spending time with his children and getting to know them. She is not a miracle worker. Mary Poppins is not the savior in the story as well. She just provides opportunities for the family to see each other. Because it is George, not Mary, that makes the decision to change, to be the person their children requested in their advertisement or prayer, the fun, forgiving, and loving parent. To not be overcome by financial success while sacrificing family connection with his boss and colleagues at the bank. George makes the choice choice to see his children's need for love and attention, and at the end, he chooses to be there to help them fly the kite. Mary just provides him the opportunity to see the good and generous and loving children that he has, and to be transformed by them. And as George sang, let's go fly a kite, holding Jane's hand as he and his wife skipped down the street into the park they had with their kite, and that they had made together. The entire neighborhood joins them in singing and bringing their own kites. George's choice to be the person from the advertisement not only changes his family, but those around him. Each kite that begins to decorate the sky is another person or family changed by the love George brought to the world. And Mary Poppins, well, she just looks on with mixed emotions, for this is what she had hoped for but now her work is done. Picking up her umbrella, she quietly ascends into the beautiful sky. So is this film really about the practically perfect Mary Poppins? Or is it about George no longer being preoccupied? Or is it about the impact of George's choices that have transformed those around him? In the same way, is the ascension of Jesus in Acts just another miraculous event to highlight Jesus' perfection, Jesus Christ, always perfect in every way. Or is it the part of the transformation of the body of Christ as a whole, all of us? Was the ascension needed for the disciples more than for Jesus? If so, what does this mean for you and me? The Ascension was a miraculous event that highlighted the perfection of Jesus, the Son of God, that the man who rose from the dead was now going up with the Father. For Jesus is the miracle worker and the Savior in our stories in Scripture. He performs miraculous healings and raises people from the dead. He was resurrected from after a brutal crucifixion and death. Our miracle worker and Savior, who does not sing songs, and is never cross or cruel, and despite it all, appears and disappears frequently during the 40 days after his resurrection. So does he really need this glorious ascension? Who is it really for? Before he ascends into heaven, he said to his disciples, you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit, and you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. These are Jesus' last words to them, they will be the witnesses, the ones to share the good news that Jesus is the Son of God, the Redeemer, the hope of new life. His final words are not about his own glory, but about the work the disciples will do to glorify God. And to do this work, the majesty of Jesus ascending up into heaven with the angels is yet another sign for them to see before they go out into the world to share the good news. It is another affirmation of the Savior they believe in. And in the Peter's letter, to be a witness, one must be humble and rely on God with their anxieties because of the difficult and challenging nature of the good news being received. That is why Jesus prays today in John, asking God to protect, protect them, the disciples and all of us, as we tell people through our relationships, our art, our service as we tell people about the redeeming love of God.
The ascension was then not as much for Jesus as it was for those who were watching, for them to be transformed by the opportunity to make a choice, to witness the perfection of Jesus once again in order to choose to share his perfect love with the world, to choose to be changed by the Holy Spirit to be a witness. This is the disciples' transformation. The physical transformation is on Pentecost, which we celebrate next week, when all of them have the Holy Spirit descend upon them, gifting them with the ability to speak new languages. But it is today at the Ascension that their spiritual transformation, where seeing Jesus go up to heaven, helps them to make the choice to live into being a witness, to choose to be ready when that day comes when the Holy Spirit equips them for ministry. And it is the disciples' choice when they witness Jesus physically leaving them to trust and love God fully, to be open for the work God has called them to do. How do we know they've been transformed? Because immediately they go to pray. They still seek to know God and to be known by God for his work. They attempt to be the men God calls them to be. Mary Poppins does not change George, and Jesus does not make the disciples change. But both George and the disciples are given a choice to be open to the transformation of love, to be willing to choose a life that is different and challenging because loving can be hard, to love and trust Jesus, to love the love and trust that Jesus had for his disciples is what allowed them to be open to the transformation when the Holy Spirit finally came. The ascension transformed the disciples. The ministry the disciples had transformed the church. Jesus' ascension is magnificent and perfect in every way, but it is how the disciples witnessed and shared the perfection of the ascension with the world, for the world to finally know Christ and to know that even though Christ is perfect, he does not expect us to be, that we are loved for who we are, who was the ascension for? Well, it was for you and for me. How has our witness of the ascension transformed us? How has the disciples living into the call of witnessing the good news, which has transformed the church and all of us today? How are we responsible? How do we go forward? In what ways can we live out this witness? Maybe we can be Mary Poppins, placing opportunities for those to help in the continued positive change of the body of Christ. Or maybe we can be George Banks, who sees those opportunity and makes the choice to live into making change. What kite do you want to fly in the world? How can we fly a kite together? Amen.